Trinity Prayer. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is not done. The church is dying, but she will rise again. Amen. So I don't know if we have a special intention yet for today's Mass. So that means I'm free to have my own intention. So I want to pray that everyone who attends the conference tonight and this weekend, that every one of you becomes a saint. Amen. So that's going to be my official intention for tonight's Mass. And Father, you feel free to join me, that all of us become saints. Amen? And one reason why, beloved, is with the little bit of experience, you know this. Only saints are happy. Everyone else is miserable. Amen? So if we become saints, we'll be the happiest people in the whole world. And that's the name of this Mass. This Mass is called the Mass of All the Saints. It's for you. Amen? Amen? So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Whoever believes, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Testing, alleluia. That's the official Catholic microphone test. The second one is Ave Maria. Well, Ireland, I love you. Thank you. My, um, my mother's mother, my grandma, she was from Ireland. Her name was Katie Carroll. Sounds pretty Italian, doesn't it? So in a way, I feel like I'm coming home when I come to Ireland. 
because I used to love my grandmother. She was so cool, my Irish grandmother. She literally, you've heard about those funny old ladies that take the lampshade and put it on their head and dance? That's what my Katie Carroll, my grandmother, would do. She was the life of the party. It's so great to have good grandparents, amen? So I know she must be smiling down on you and I right now. Hi, Grandma. And she was an awesome lady. I would go to visit her at the nursing home. Uh, we didn't want to put her in the nursing home. In fact, I invited her to live with my brother and I when we were very young. And, but my grandmother chose because it was a very good nursing home with a really good care. So we would visit her frequently. I would say maybe three times a week we'd go to visit Grandma. And when we went, we would stay with her for one, two, or three or more hours. So whenever you go to visit somebody in the nursing home, don't stay just for five minutes. That's not nice. They need you for 55 minutes. Amen? But here I was a teenager going to the nursing home to visit my grandma. And this is what I would actually encounter when I walk in the front door of the nursing home. It's a very nice place, actually. And turn to the right down the main corridor. She would be waiting for me in her wheelchair. She'd be waiting. And when she spotted me all the way down the hallway, she'd put her hands up and she would say this to this teenage boy. She would say, Jimmy, I love you! That was the best medicine for a teenage boy you could possibly give me. Amen? And the whole nursing home knew when I was there. Every single time. And when I, when I got finished with the visit, true, this is all a true story, would always stay with Grandma, you know, I would say at least two hours minimum. We, you know, we joked and had a good time. And we'd take her on a spin on the wheelchair outside. It was a McDonald's down the street. And we'd go down to the McDonald's and get a cup of coffee and an ice cream cone. They would bring her back. We had the best time in the world. It was time to go. Then Grandma would stop me. And she would say, no, Jimmy, before you go, Mr. Smith is in the room next door. And his family never visits him. I want you to stop and see Mr. Smith. Oh, sure, Grandma. And after Mr. Smith, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Carroll is about three doors down. And no one ever sees her either. So I want you to go visit her too. And I usually have three or four on my list before I could leave. So I had to go to each one and hug them like they're my own grandma, my own grandpa. I would hug them and kiss them and talk to them like five minutes each. And to go back and report to my grandma that I, I did my duty. Okay, grandma, I got them all. Then she would hug me and send me going. Isn't that beautiful? Such a grandmother. Did she learn that in Ireland? Isn't that beautiful? So I see that in the country of Ireland, there is a kernel of divine mercy in your hearts. There's a kernel or a seed of divine mercy in the hearts of the people of Ireland. And God is going to water that seed in Ireland. And one day, all of Ireland will be Catholic again. Amen. Well, you know it from the Bible, right? Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. So sacred scripture ended today with that beautiful thought that Jesus said to the apostles, there are some among you even now. You will not go to your rest until you see the kingdom of God established in glory. And so I feel the same way today. That there are many of us here that you will not die before you see the victory of the Lord. There is a great victory coming. It's been prophesied by a whole bunch of saints, including St. Faustina. It's been prophesied. That something marvelous is happening. So I want to share with you 
at least one or two of my experiences about this. Have you heard of the venerable mother Mariana Torres? Kind of a, a beautiful saint from Ecuador. She was, I think, 12 years old when she asked her mother and father in Spain if she could go with her aunt. Her aunt was a Catholic nun, the superior, and her aunt was going to take a, a sailboat all the way from Spain to South America, where the bishop of the colony of Ecuador asked for a convent of contemplative nuns. So this little 12-year-old girl said she wanted to go too. Of course, in those days, I'm a missionary myself, but in those days, when a missionary go to another country, you never got back to your homeland. It was goodbye. That's pretty courageous, isn't it, for a 12-year-old girl? to say goodbye to her father and mother like that, and pretty generous of her mother and father to let her go. And she went with her aunt, who was a holy nun, and a group of about six nuns, and they went across the seas, and the, the story is told. Her whole story has been checked and approved by the bishop. Her testimony and her revelations have an imprimatur. The story is told as halfway across the ocean, a great storm came up out of nowhere. There's even some testimony from the sailors who were sailing the boat. A huge storm. And the boat was about to sink. And Mariana turned to her aunt, this little 12-year-old girl, who was going with her aunt and the other nuns because she wanted to be a nun too. She turned to her aunt and she said, They're after me, aren't they? They're after me, she said. And a great dragon was seen in the water, a dragon. Not just by the Catholic nuns, but by the sailors as well. They saw like a dragon come out, the worst storm they've ever encountered, and grown men were crying. And her aunt said to her, yes, it's true. And so they prayed the Hail Mary together, the aunt and little girl, and the dragon disappeared and the storm stopped immediately. Every time you have a mission from God, a storm will come up to try to stop you. That's probably what's happening in Ireland right now. There's always a terrible storm before the great miracle. Amen? Now it's worldwide, isn't it? But that's a wonderful example in her life the devil was trying to destroy her before she could ever become a nun. It didn't work. They said a Hail Mary. The storm stopped and they made it all the way to Ecuador, which was a colony, not a country. She became a nun. And in short order, she became the superior. I believe, having read her, her life, that she's one of the greatest women who have ever lived in the history of the world. She's like Teresa of Avila. She should be a doctor of the church. The revelations she received were stunning. Mary and the angels would appear to her on a regular basis. And she received uh, many prophecies about the next 400 years. So this is back in the late 1500s and 1600. She received all these prophecies that all came true. But there are several that are for us today. Her body is incorrupt, completely incorrupt. I prayed there just a few months ago. But she received this particular word I need to share with you. Our Lady told her that by the year 1950, this is amazing, it's like more than 400 years ago, but Mary said by the year 1950, darkness would cover the earth. Darkness around the year 1950. That's when television sets began to multiply across the world in the 1950s. And Our Lady told her darkness would cover the earth and the sacraments would begin to disappear. Then Our Lady told her that by the year 2000, she actually mentioned the name of the year, the number, 
by the year 2000. The darkness would be so heavy, you could barely find one innocent soul, even among the children. Can you spell iPhone? Can you spell iPad? How did the Virgin Mary know before 1600 that by the year 2000, our children would be corrupted by their iPhones and their iPads? One of the saddest things I ever saw in my whole priestly life I was coming into our country from another, to United States from another country, and there was a young couple, a man and his wife, and a beautiful little baby boy in the stroller, and I was waiting for my ride to pick me up, and they were waiting for someone to come off the airplane. And finally I heard a, a beautiful, loving scream. So they were waiting for someone in their family, and I could see that it was the sister of the mother, the sister of the bride, so the young man and his wife and the little boy, her sister was coming off the plane, looked just like her. And they all hugged. So she hugged her sister, then she hugged her brother-in-law, and then she went down to hug that little boy, her nephew. And it was, it was obvious to me that she was seeing that little boy for the first time. She was there to say hello. He was maybe two and a half years old, maybe three. He was cute as a button. And he had in his little hands an iPad. I mean, like three years old with an iPad. And he's playing it. And his aunt, who's never seen before, she's seeing him for the first time. She's hugging him and cooing over him. And the little boy, not even once, looked up at his aunt. Not even once. And she tried to kiss him and to hug him. And I saw her look up at her sister and her brother-in-law with a, a look of desperation in her face. But she tried to hide her disappointment. So they wouldn't see how disappointed she was. I want to tell you, that was one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my entire life. This beautiful little child playing with an iPad, not even for a split second made eye contact with his aunt, not even for a split second to hug her and say, I love you. That's all he had in his hand. So beloved, this has happened to our teenagers, hasn't it? And it's destroying them. It's destroying them. And I know. I remember when I was preaching out in the West United States of America, in cowboy country. I was hearing the confessions of the families. And this teenage boy came in for confession. And he was a good boy. And I knew his family. And he started crying. And this little boy was addicted to pornography on his cell phone. He was honest. He told me, Father, I can't stop. I understand from psychiatrists and psychologists that when you start pornography as a child or a teenager, your mind is not yet fully developed. So it becomes like twice or ten times more addictive when you're young. No one should look at it. But when you look at it when you're young, you become addicted, almost like crack cocaine. He said, I can't get free from it. He started weeping. He was a good boy. I would say maybe maybe 16 years of age. And so, I mean, I asked the boy, I said, well, listen, have you told your dad and mom? Where do you watch the pornography? He said, on my cell phone. I said, at home? He said, yes. So that means you have a Wi-Fi signal in the house. Have you spoken at least to your dad to tell him? He says, I can't, Father, I can't. I said, well, you need to because it's killing you. It's killing you. And he cried. I said, Father, I can't do it. I said, would you let me talk to him? Because this is his confession, you see. I'm not allowed to reveal anything in confession. <clears throat> However, if the young man gives me permission, I am allowed with his permission to talk to his dad about the problem. Not his sins, but the problem. So he said, okay. 
You can talk to my dad. And so I encountered the father, who was a giant rancher, a cowboy rancher. I encountered him the next day. I said, Dad, I need to speak to you. Yes, Father. I said, Dad, do you have Wi-Fi, the Internet in your home? And he paused and looked at me. I, uh-oh. He said, yes, Father. I said, Dad, you've got to turn it off. Put some filters on right away. You've got to stop it. And he looked at me almost trembling. He was a good man, a Catholic man. Why, Father? I said, I think you know why. Your children are being destroyed by pornography. And you need to do something about it. He began to weep in front of me. A man twice as big as me began to shake and to weep. You've got to do this. And I would say this to Ireland today. I don't know Ireland that well, but I'd be willing to guess it's a problem here with, our, <clears throat> with the teenagers. Is that right, fathers? I would guess it's a big problem. We need to be man enough, courageous enough to turn off the internet or to put filters on it for our young people. Amen? So he agreed to do it. This is what's destroying our young people above everything else. But then the Virgin Mary said to Mother Mariana Torres, the young nun in Ecuador, who's now venerable, the pregnant bishop says he wants to canonize her. It's the only Marian apparition in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the only one that was approved by the bishop the day it happened, by every single bishop for the last 400 years in the diocese. It's the only Marian apparition approved by every bishop of the diocese from the day it happened to this very day. That's how solid it is. But then Our Lady said something to Mariana Torres and reminded me of today's gospel, that there are some here, you will not die before you see the glory of the Lord, the kingdom established in glory. You know what Our Lady said to Mariana Torres next? Would you listen to this now? Do you have your seatbelts on right now, guys? Would you buckle your seatbelts for a moment? Mother Mariana said this. Shortly after the year 2000, just when it appears that everything is lost. Does that sound familiar? Shortly after the year 2000, just when it appears that everything is lost, I shall come down from heaven with my son. We will wrap Satan in chains. We will cast him into hell and we will convert the human race. And her body is completely incorrupt. And so are three other nuns in the same convent who heard the same apparition. I know of no other convent in the world where there's four nuns incorrupt from one community. And so I was preaching in, in Lima, Peru last year. Then we went to Ecuador. And I asked my team, let's go visit the convent. I've never had the chance actually to see her body in person. And so the nuns let us in. And I'm an exorcist priest by training. And they, they had a secret deal they wanted to make with me. They said, Father, you do an exorcism of the entire convent. Then we'll have you come and we'll show you the body of the saint. So that was a pretty good deal. You know what I mean? So I did the exorcism of the whole convent. And then they brought us in to where the glass coffin is. And there was the body of Mariana Torres in front of us. It's something striking to see. Have you ever seen an incorrupt saint before? Raise your hand. If you have in person, if you ever seen one in person, would you raise your holy hand if you've seen an incorrupt saint? Good, because you're going to be incorrupt too. This mass is for you to become saints. Amen? We're going to put the, all the funeral takers out of business. You're all going to be incorrupt. It's something amazing to see. Her body has no wax on it. 
And you know, many of the Incarnates, most of them, like Padre Pio, who I love, 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 that's a wax face. That's wax. He's not completely incorrupt. But this young woman is 100% 100 incorrupt. I've never seen anything like it in the world. Incredible. I think maybe St. Bernadette of Subaru, she may be the only other one that incorrupt. And so I was so moved, and I knelt down with my team in front of the glass coffin, and we began to pray. And I was there for one reason only. I was there that the prophecies given by Our Lady to this saint, approved by every bishop of that diocese, would now be revealed and come to pass. I was there to plead for the victory to come. It's the only reason I was there. So we prayed. I was praying quietly with all my heart. You can't wait. People are dying. The church is dying. The teenagers are dying. You can't wait. It's shortly after the year 2000. And everything's almost lost. Even in Rome, things are almost lost. You can't wait. Please come. Please fulfill your prophecy. As I'm praying quietly but with tears, the nun who was watching over us, she said to me, in Spanish, we said, Padrecito, Father, wait here. Well, it wasn't going anywhere anyway. But she, she disappeared. And I didn't know what she was about. But I thought that she had some duty to do. She would come back and forget us. So she walked quickly away. And she was gone. And about three or four minutes later, she comes back in with a key. We never had said anything to her. We we're completely quiet because we're overwhelmed by the presence of sanctity. We're overwhelmed. We didn't say a word in English or Spanish. She came back with a key. She went to the back of the glass coffin and opened it, which never happens. And she looked at me and she said to me, Father, touch the saint. That never happens. You know that. And like I'm kind of like in shock. But then again, I'm so used to the Holy Spirit, I never know what he's going to do next. He's probably going to do a miracle tonight at some point, you see? I never know what he's going to do. One of the secrets of the priesthood is this. Don't be in charge. Let God be in charge. Amen? Don't be in charge of your life. So that was another surprise from the Holy Spirit. And I obeyed her, and I reached into the glass coffin. I couldn't believe it. This is one of the holiest women who've ever lived. Honestly. Like the top five, you might say, of all time. And I go to touch, and because she's a woman and I'm a man, I respect that. I did not want to touch her body, you know what I mean, indiscriminately. I, I, my dad taught me that way. And even though she's long gone, her body looks like she's going to get up and start walking. Is that fresh? I do not want to touch her body in any disrespectful way. So I decided only to touch her foot. I heard that might be okay, you know. So I reached in and touched her holy foot. Small, a small foot. And beloved, my hand began to shake from her foot. The power of the Holy Spirit, electricity, was coming through her foot to my hand. It was something phenomenal. And when I was done praying there, I asked Sister if my team could touch her too. I had a deacon with me and his wife and another married couple. We, we work as a team. She said yes. So my deacon reached in and touched her foot, then his wife, then the other married couple. And I looked at them, and they looked at me. They were receiving the same ele electrical pulse from her foot. And I put it together after we locked back up the coffin. Her foot was moving. Her foot. You use your feet to move. I felt God was trying to tell us, I'm getting ready to stand up and move. I'm getting ready to move. 
And so when we left the convent, we went down to the city square of Quito, Ecuador, it's the capital, Quito. So the city square is actually the national square of the country of Ecuador. So we went down there after all of this, and it was a, like a Saturday afternoon. It was filled with people. And it was the filthiest national square I've ever seen. The people were singing like dirty songs. There was an, an acting a, a troupe there doing a, some sort of play where they were screaming at one another. There were people doing drugs and selling drugs. There was even a woman dressed like Satan in a black suit with black wings. It was grotesque. It was horrible. And I looked at all of this nonsense. There were even witches outside the convent. And my, my team said, Father Jim, exercise them, exercise them right now. I said, well, I don't have the bishop's permission right now. But I said, give me some of those St. Benedict medals. So I went up to each one of the witches and I said, hello, senorita. I have a gift for you. They said, oh, thank you, gracias, padrecito. And I gave them a little St. Benedict medal. They put it on. All the witches were wearing St. Benedict medals. Amen. There's more than one way to slay a cat. Amen. So we go out to the square. It is terrible. So I told my team, we are going to bless the square right now. So we pull out your rosaries, guys, I told them. We pull out our rosaries. We began to pray the rosary. And I had two of my helpers with a whole bunch of St. Benedict medals. And another one with exercise holy water. I said, now let's go. So we walked through the square, praying the rosary. Two of the ladies passing out St. Benedict medals, everyone there. Two of the men sprinkling holy water. We go through the national square. As I get to the end of the first side on a bright Saturday afternoon, Thunder, <laughs> thunder rolls across the sky. Out of nowhere on a bright Saturday afternoon. I look at my team and I go like this. You did it again. He's always got our back. Amen. He's always got our back. We just do his holy will, and he does the rest. Amen. I'm not God. You're not God. He's God. Let him do it. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm getting those Holy Spirit goosebumps. You know what I'm trying to say? Right now, Holy Spirit goosebumps. My friend calls them dove bumps. Well, the thunder came and people were shocked, but I really wasn't shocked. I had what Padre Pio called the weapon in my hand, the rosary. Why not thunder? I'd be surprised if it didn't thunder with Our Lady. Amen? So we turned the corner to the second side. My friends are sprinkling holy water passing out medals, even to the Satan worshipers, to everybody. I'm wondering, why are they there around this holy convent? That's why they're there, you see? The devil always commits sacrilege. So we went to clear it out. I went down the second side. I get near here, and suddenly, a second round of thunder. And the square began to clear out. I said, let's keep going. So we went down the third side. Blessing everything with a priestly blessing. Get over here. A third thunder and a little bit of rain, a tiny bit of rain. By the time we got to the fourth side, I tell you, I'm not exaggerating, not one single person was left in the entire square. It was gone. The same Jesus Christ who rules in Ecuador with his mother, he rules in Dublin. It's the same Jesus. Amen? So consider, 
getting your rosary teams together and going to the town squares of Dublin, going to the abortion clinics, going where the darkest is the worst, and go there with your rosaries and your holy water and give them a little bit of heaven. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, beloved, that's a prophecy approved by all the bishops of Quito, Ecuador, all of them. Now the present bishop wants to canonize Mariana Torres. This is for Ireland, for Dublin as well. Shortly after the year 2000, just when it appears that everything is lost, I will come down from heaven with my son. We will chain Lucifer. We will cast him into hell. And we will convert the human race. Hallelujah. So there's a prayer I want to teach you right now. And if we can, maybe we can make some copies for you tomorrow. It's the new prayers to bind the evil spirit. They come from Budapest, Hungary. That's where I was this morning. Elizabeth Kindleman, the visionary or the locutionist who received the flame of love diary, the flame of love. There are prayers that are meant for this time, for such a time as this. So what I want to do is have everyone stand with me just for a minute. And we're going to pray the most important prayer called the unity prayer. And I'm sure some of you have heard of it. The unity prayer. Amen. It is powerful. It has the approval now, I think, of seven bishops. I was with uh, Cardinal Erdo just yesterday. He's the Archbishop of Budapest. He gave it his imprimatur as well. And the promise of this prayer is this. It's for Ireland too. It's not just for Hungary. It's not just for Ecuador. It's for Ireland. Amen. And this promise is this. That whenever we say this prayer, I, the Lord, will come down from heaven and I will blind Satan and I will paralyze him so that you are free. So I tested it in an exorcism a few years ago. I had just learned it and the lady began to manifest the evil spirits at the end of one of my masses. I mean, screaming and foaming at the mouth. Her eyes went back, rolled back, but just white there in her eyes, just the white. She was out of control. And I had my team gather around her and say this prayer. I didn't have time to call the bishop to get permission for an exorcism. No time. She was screaming and out of control like an animal. But I don't need permission to say a fully approved prayer, you see. And so I said, gather around her. I wanted to test the promise. My dad taught me always test things. I know God is real, but I like to test things. I said, let's test this one. And we said the prayer you and I are about to say right now for Dublin. I have never seen this. I've worked in the ministry of healing and exorcism for more than 40 years. I have never seen this before, ever. Most exorcisms take from one to five hours and sometimes from one to five visits, appointments. This woman, as we said the prayer, she was completely set free from Lucifer in one minute. I've never seen this before. The same thing happened again a few months later, identical. I flew to Europe. They told me five exorcists here in Europe had the same experience that we had. So I'm going to teach you now. Is that okay? You each will owe me one million dollars at the end of the night. We'll take a collection, either cash or check, but I'll take three Hail Marys instead. Is that okay? Is it a deal? This is the unity prayer approved by the church that blinds evil spirits, paralyzes them. We need to have this prayer said throughout Dublin and please go on throughout Ireland. You will begin to blind and paralyze the anti-Catholic spirit, the homosexual awoken woke spirit, the alcoholic spirit, the corruption spirit. You'll begin to blind and paralyze all of them. That's why I'm hearing a demon over my head scream right now. 
He doesn't want me to share this with you. But I'm about to give you a million dollars in heavenly currency. Are you ready? Would you say this after me line by line? It says an imprimatur. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Would you say this after me, beloved? My adorable Jesus. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. How's that? Isn't that beautiful? Is that not a beautiful prayer? It reminds me of my mother, the Virgin Mary. Why? This prayer is a poem. But don't be fooled. It's powerful against Lucifer himself. Mary is as beautiful as a poem. The Virgin is utterly beautiful. But she wears combat boots. Amen? Don't be fooled by appearances. So this prayer, I'm going to say with you now a second time for all of Dublin. We just blinded things here from this hall. Will you say it a second time with me for all of Dublin? Let's say it now with the intention that all the demons over your beautiful city are going to be blinded right now. Amen? I can hear them screaming right now. Praise the Lord. Isn't it fun to be a Christian? It's fun, isn't it? We're in a battle of our life and we have the weapons to win. We have what we need to win. A second time now for all of Dublin. And we'll say it again tomorrow. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you say this now for our city? My adorable Jesus. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Talk about mercy. Amen. This is mercy to blind the evil spirit, to paralyze him so that Dublin can breathe again. Amen. Alleluia. Can we give Jesus a strong round of applause to the Lord? The Lord says... I love you. He loves you. Amen? Ireland, we're going to win. We're not going to lose. We're going to win this battle. Amen? Say this prayer every day. If there's anybody here for the Flame of Love movement, if you could maybe bring us some cards tomorrow. It's printed up called the Unity Prayer. Please, if you could bring us some, maybe a 500, maybe a 1,000, as many as you can. Yes. Good, 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 Mama. Good. You're beautiful. One of your Irish men are going to bring us 3,000 tomorrow. You'll be the most protected city on the face of the earth. Let's get everyone in Dublin praying this prayer and then everyone in Ireland. Amen? 
Hallelujah. So we're going to continue with the Mass. I want to keep on preaching. I, I can preach all night, but my, my fellow priests will get mad at me in just a minute. So I better stop right now. But I love you too. I love you. The reason I'm a priest is this. I love the Holy Trinity. I love Mary. And I love you, their sons and daughters. Amen. Let's now continue with the Holy Mass so that the love of God becomes incarnate in the host. The love of God will become flesh and blood in front of us. We're going to receive the greatest gift available to the human race in just a few minutes. Amen. One Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus.